you know, like trying to explain to people like that it's like school, but like doing a PhD and being in a doctorate program isn't just school. Like it's not like undergrad where you're like just in class. And I think that adjustment for not only myself, but also having to explain it to people was like a huge shift. And that was pretty difficult, I think, for me, because like I felt like people weren't getting it. And I felt like people were like, oh, you're just in school. Like, just call me when you're out of class. It was like, no, it's like class. And then my clients and then like learning stuff. And then like my research is more than just school. What is up, fam? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Phil Sarpon. This is Phil's Guide to PsyD. This channel is dedicated to all things psychology, wellness, and graduate school. Today, we have a very special guest with us today. Her name is Tanisha. You guys may know her from her YouTube channel called Renee's Corner, which is basically all about getting students through grad school. She shares valuable insights and input and advice into how to navigate your way through graduate school. She is currently in her internship year and getting ready to graduate with her PhD in clinical psychology. I'm super excited to have her here today. As I've mentioned before on the channel, I think it's really important to get insight and information from someone who has been through the process, whether they are a couple steps into the process or whether they are many, many steps through the process. And I think she's gonna be able to share a lot of really good stuff with us today on how to navigate and basically survive grad school. So before we jump into that interview, I do want to get a little bit more into her introduction so that you guys can know a little bit more about Tanisha. So Tanisha graduated from Hampton University in 2016. She earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology with an emphasis in family and marital counseling. From there, she went on to the University of Pittsburgh to complete a one-year post back. And after that, she went on to do some research on social emotional skill differences between black and white children with similar social economic status. As I mentioned before, she is currently in her internship year getting ready to graduate next year. And she plans to continue to provide evidence based culturally sensitive care to families and their children in the future. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the interview. All right, Tanisha. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm doing great. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much for having the time for us. This interview has been long awaited and I'm super excited to get into it. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. I feel like we've been talking about it for like months now. And I'm like, yes, finally we can get it done. I was like, <laughs> yes, let's go. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's just jump right into it. Uh, first of all, so I know that you are currently in your internship right now, and we'll talk a little bit more about your internship process later on. But even for right now, I'd just love to know just in general, what got you into clinical psychology and kind of your journey into clinical psychology in grad school? Yeah, so in high school, I took a psychology class like on a whim, just like an elective. Uh, prior to that, I was going to go to school for lawyer. I was going to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a politician. Um, and so I took this psych class and it like changed my entire life. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And so then from there, I went to Hampton University and HBCU in Virginia. And I just, I was like, oh, I'll be a marriage and family counselor. I really want to focus on families, but not so much marriage because I took a managing family class and I was like, oh no, this couple stuff is not for me. I was like, this isn't it. And so then I had to like go back to the drawing board of like, okay, let's find a different career because I was like, nope, I'm not gonna do this uh, marriage and family thing anymore. So then like I discovered research a little bit. I had an internship out at Stanford. I was like, oh, this research thing is really cool. Like I could do this with psychology. And then, um, yeah, I just kind of like stumbled into it. I had some mentors be like, I think you should go get your PhD. And I was like, mm, no, I'm not gonna do that. And they're like, no, no, I think you should really do it. <laughs> and so um, as I like went through Hampton, I was like kind of like resisting them being like, you should go get your doctor. And I was like, nah, it's not for me. I'm just gonna get a master's and be done. And then, um, yeah, I did like an internship and I was like, okay, yeah, maybe this PhD thing will be cool. 
Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like it's been like a lot of little steps into the journey of clinical psych. And then I just really like stumbled into it and it's just been a great fit since then. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, that no, that's so cool to hear. So for your internship, you said you took an internship right before kind of going into clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. What was that process like for you? Yeah, so at Hampton, I was a part of the Honors College. And so um, they had, like, they send out these newsletters about internships and stuff. And so it was um, at Stanford and at UCLA, or not UCLA, UC Berkeley, um, where I was doing research, really like transcribing interviews, like typical research assistant stuff with um, this group of people at Berkeley where they were researching like what makes the schools for African-American students successful and like what makes the schools not successful in the Oakland School District. There are some schools in that district that are like phenomenal for black kids and so they were like okay what is it about these schools and so they interviewed the kids the principals the parents and like the schools that were performing really well and then the schools that weren't performing as well and then like that was my real first exposure to like just research that wasn't like research methods class and i was like this is amazing like how can i do this for the rest of my life like it just changed research for me. And I, I was so appreciative because like, it was cool research, it was cool interviews that we were getting to do. We got to present to the lab that we were working a part of and just, it was just like awesome. So yeah, that was at Stanford and sort of kind of Berkeley. Got you, okay, that's amazing. I think it's so cool that like, I think even with clinical psychology, like even for me, I didn't have a lot of information about it. And so it's cool that as you started to know more about it and you got opportunities to learn more about it, it became more clear to you over time. And so I, I love the fact that it was something that you were like, oh, this is not what I want to do. But then you started to see, like, even with the research and stuff like that, how it could be something that you could see yourself doing. Yeah, for so, sure. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about maybe your first few years in graduate school and what that was like for you in being a clinical psychology doctoral student. Yeah, it's so weird. It feels like in some ways, like I'm done with that phase of my life, but I'm still like also still a doctoral student. Um, so I go to St. Louis University. Um, and so it's a, I would say a smaller program. Well, I don't know, smaller in the sense of like, it's not one of, it's not like a huge R1 institution, but they do a lot of research. It has been, I think a really good training experience. Like. I remember like when I first got there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly where I should be. Like my mentor um, is Dr. Kira Banks. She's amazing. She's like this awesome black woman, clinical psychologist, but she also does like a lot of work outside of like academia, which is what I really want to do. And so it's just been awesome. Like I feel like the first year was just a lot of coursework. And then like once I started doing more of the clinical stuff in my second year, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I should be doing, um, which feels good because I know that some people don't get that experience of like, ah, is this what I should be doing or not? But when I do like therapy or when I'm like working with kids, like it just feels so natural and so like, right? It makes me so happy. Yeah, I mean, I heard, so I heard, that it seemed like there was a lot of different interests there, right? Because you've talked a little bit about your research and you, you seem to really like therapy and stuff like that. So I guess as you were going through graduate school, was it clear in the beginning of like what you knew that you wanted to do for your career or did it kind of shape over time in terms of the experiences that were coming your way? Yeah, I still feel like it's not clear to me what I want to do. There's just too many options and they all are really cool and I'm very indecisive. Um, so as I was going through my program, I think my, I guess, inkling was to just try it all, like try all the things. So I'm a child psychologist in training, I guess. And so there's a lot of child psychology, like, uh, sorry, there's somebody backing up outside. A lot of child psychology um, opportunities. And so I was just like, I'm gonna try them all. Like, what'll happen? So I tried working at a school. I've worked in a children's hospital. Um, I worked at like an autism center. I have done a private practice. And so I was like, let me try all of these things because I, 
I'm indecisive. I don't know what I want to do anyway, so I might as well try all the things out. And um, that is good in a way, like I've had lots of experiences, but also bad because it didn't help me decide what I want to do at all. So, I mean, I still, um, I would recommend that to anyone to like try out all the things because like, at least for me coming into clinical psychology, I didn't know really what I was getting into. And I like, even now I still feel like I'm learning stuff about clinical psychology that I just didn't know when I was like applying. And so like, for me, I'm like, I didn't know. So let me try it all out and see what fits, what doesn't fit. Got you. Okay. Yeah. I, I can totally relate because I think even for me, I was definitely a little overwhelmed with all of the different things that clinical psychologists in general can do. It was my, you know, first exposure to testing and assessment. And so I was doing a lot of neuropsych testing and um, neuropsych testing is great, you know, but it was definitely something that was different for me. And yeah. I think you bring up a lot of different points of like, yeah, there's, there's the research side, there's the teaching side, there's the therapeutic aspect of it. And so it is good to kind of see, you know, take it step by step and kind of try different things to see what you like and what you might not like. So. Yeah, it's so funny that you bring up assessment. I remember my first year, like we had an assessment class and I was like, I have no idea what this <laughs> is. And the teacher was like, okay, what's everyone's like experience with assessment? I was like, I didn't even know this was a thing until I got here. So like, I have zero experience. I have no idea what's going on, but I'm here to learn. And so like, it was just ugh, so funny because I just didn't know. Like, I think I had a vague idea, but like, I didn't know that's what I would be doing. And so, Gosh. yeah. And now I like love assessment. I was like, man, I've been missing out. I could have been doing this. <laughs> I'd love to know a little bit about maybe some of the challenges that you had. Um, so maybe as you were going through graduate school, obviously graduate school isn't all rainbows and sunshine. There are some difficult challenges. It can be busy at times. And so what were some of those things like in terms of how you went through them and how you kind of overcame those challenges? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges for me was moving to St. Louis. So I'm a military kid, I move a lot. Um, and I had grew up about like 40 minutes or so north of St. Louis. And so I hadn't been to the city as an adult ever. And so like my conceptualization of St. Louis was very skewed by like middle school Tanisha. And then when I moved as an adult, I was like, this is so different. And my parents weren't there. And just like the isolation, I think that comes with graduate school of like, my peers are all having like jobs and like accomplishing other things where I felt like I was just like in school some more. And then I think, you know, like trying to explain to people like that it's like school, but like, doing a PhD and being in a doctorate program isn't just school. Like, it's not like undergrad where you're like just in class. And I think that adjustment for not only myself, but also having to explain it to people was like a huge shift. And that was pretty difficult, I think, for me, because like, I felt like people weren't getting it. And I felt like people were like, oh, you're just in school. Like, just call me when you're out of class. I was like, no, it's like class. And then my clients and then like learning stuff. And then like my research is more than just school. And so I think like that adjustment was like a pretty heavy lift just because like, I think we're learning so much so fast while also trying to adjust to a new program, new plays, while also trying to like figure out your feet as a professional. And so it's a lot, it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. It's like all these things thrown at you. You're not gonna be able to drink that much. You're just gonna be overwhelmed. Right. Um, so I think that for me was like my biggest challenge. I think the first two years and then the last two years, I think I did a much better job of finding community and other doctors students um, throughout the pandemic, uh, which is kind of like counterintuitive. You think I'd be more social before the pandemic, but I feel like I'm more social after, um, well, after the pandemic. And so I think the last two years, the biggest challenge was just like time management. There's just so much to do, like applying the internship, applying the practicum. I think in your third year, there's just so much more at stake. Like there's just so many balls in the air. Like you're just like, oh, I'm whole, I'm like handling it, but it's really scary and I don't know what's going on. So I think that was yeah. like the biggest challenge is just like managing it and learning like, I guess that you're managing it doesn't look the same as like your classmates managing it. And so like, learning to be okay with that too, I think was probably one of my biggest challenges. 
That's so true. I think the the transition of grad school is real. And like from going from undergrad or even if you've worked for a couple of years and then you go into graduate school, like it's still an uphill battle to try and figure out all of the different moving pieces because it, I mean, just like you said, it's like you do go to class, but then after class, like you still have tons of different things that you have left to do. Yeah. And so I think of it as very much easily, it could be a full-time job, um, sometimes even more than a full-time job because you could be working on research and dissertation. And so, yeah, absolutely. Sure. I, I totally, totally relate with you in that way. What were some of the, I guess, the joyful moments that you had uh, in terms of, it could be related to clinical stuff, it could be related to research, um, but any fond memories that you've had in, in the four years that you went through graduate school? Yeah, I think there's a lot. I like, I feel like at SLU, one of the things I love a lot is the people. And so like the people at SLU are just incredible. And so I feel like that is like all of my memories of like being with them. We would have picnics, go to the parks and stuff. Like those are like so near and dear to me. I think probably my most fond memory of like clinical stuff is like my first like well okay i'll say two so my first like child groups that i was doing at the schools and the, like when you see kids starting to get the concepts of like mm -hmm. oh i don't have to react every time i'm having negative feelings like i can use these strategies and like seeing them get it was like incredible because i was like i'm not really doing like i feel like i'm not doing that much here with them like they're yeah. not getting it and then like there's just like one day they get it and like I was teaching like social emotional skills and then one day like one of the kids was like oh I almost got in a fight but I remembered like if I just pause and let my brain slow down I won't get in the fight and I did it and I was like oh my gosh like he actually has been listening to me for these weeks when I've been like talking and so yeah. I think that was like so incredible to, like when your clients like get something that you've been trying to like teach them or like build the skill up and they use it in real life I think that's incredible and I think the second story is like very similar to that. Like I had a kid in my third year, well, my fourth year who just was like doing so well, like all of a sudden, like we went from like being like very acute in crisis sort of therapy client to like someone who I was like, oh, well we can meet every like three weeks. Like you're doing fine. Like we don't have to meet anymore. And I think like transitioning the client out of therapy was really hard for me because it was just like, I was so attached to him and I didn't want him to leave, but like he didn't need me or he didn't uh -huh. need any therapy anymore. And so I think those are some of like the fondest things. Like I think just like, I guess that client interactions and like patient interactions feels so good. Like I just love it so much. <laughs> that light bulb moment is so real. Like, cause I, I'm in my therapy practicum site right now and Going from last year to doing like mostly testing and assessment, uh, which was great, but you know, you wouldn't really see clients on a consistent basis. You would right. just go through the testing and then kind of send them on their way. And with therapy, it's like you really are building this relationship with them on a week to week basis. And it's so cool, like you talked about, when they get, they, it, it, something clicks or you, they get that yeah. light bulb moment where they're like, oh my gosh, like this is why I do that or this is why I do this. And so I've really loved that and appreciate that about my, my therapy practicum as well. It's been, yeah. it's been really cool to see. It's super cool. Like, it's like, I don't know, it's like indescribable because you're like, oh, like you get it. Like I get it, but like now you're getting it too. It just, yeah, it just feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> so what, because I know you've already kind of mentioned a little bit about what you want to do in the future, but what, let's say 10 years from now, what do you want to be doing? Like you talked about kids and stuff like that. Do you want to specialize in child psychology or, you know, is it, do you see yourself on a day-to-day -day basis doing both therapy or assessment, or is it going to be a little bit of both or one or the other? Like, where do you want to see yourself in 10 years? Yeah, that is the million dollar question I'm asking myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still, yeah, I primarily want to work with kids. I would love to like do like emerging adult down um like 25 and younger it's probably like my sweet spot of like therapy cases um i i have no idea honestly like internship has just like highlighted that there's just so many cool things to do and it's just like yeah 
So I think 10 years down the line, hopefully I have made a decision and I am not still indecisive. Like I could see myself doing therapy a little bit. I really like working in the hospitals. I didn't, you know, I worked at the Children's Hospital in St. Louis, but I didn't, it was like all chronic pain. And so I didn't get the experience of doing other things um, in the hospital. And so I really love that. Like I've been working with kids with sickle cell and that's like, I love it so much. Like it is incredible. Like I just, I, yeah, I get such like goosebumps when I work with them. Um, so I would love to continue doing that, but I don't want to do that all the time because it's like heavy emotionally. So like, I would love to continue doing like baby autism stuff. Well, baby is a strong word, like 18 months to five-year-old autism assessments. I really like that. Um, I'm hoping to continue doing like consulting work. I would love to do like parent stuff, like parent training and maybe like, uh, like helping parents navigate the school systems when they're getting testing done. Um, but yeah, so that's the vague idea. I have no idea what the next thing <laughs> will look like to be honest. Um, but it's exciting because I feel like so far I haven't found anything that I like absolutely don't want to do. So mm. I just keep trying it and figure it out. I guess I, I got to figure it out soon because I need to apply to postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is super exciting because, yeah, there's endless possibilities of what you could do. And the training that you've already gotten so far is only going to prepare prepare you and, and propel you to what you do next. And so it, I, I feel the same way, too, in terms of like I feel like every semester I learn something and I'm like, oh, I could do that. I could like specialize yeah. in like trauma or I could do more like community psychology or I could do this. And so yeah it, it's it's definitely like a, a learning curve of like okay what do i actually want to do but it's cool though that you do have time at least and you can still kind of figure it out as you go along the way so yeah. i know um i do want to talk briefly because i'm sure a lot of the audience already knows your work you do have a youtube channel uh yeah. which is called renee's corner which is actually how i found you and i do have to say Thank you, thank you, thank you for that YouTube channel, because even when I was thinking about clinical psychology and I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to go into clinical psychology school, I was looking online and I was looking on YouTube and your channel came up and I think I watched so many of your videos. Uh, you described the field so well and you described, you know, your personal experiences and stuff like that, too. And that just helped me to give uh, just a better idea of what it could look like for me. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that channel. Um, is there, do you have any plans of that channel? What, how, how, well, actually I wanna know, how did that channel come up for you? Like, how did you start that channel? And um, yeah, where do you see that channel going forward in the future? Yeah, so Renee's Corner did not start, start out as a grad school channel. Um, I think I started it when like, it was almost like, a couple months after I hadn't gotten into grad school, the first time I applied and I was like super lonely, like all my friends had moved from Hampton. I was still living in Hampton because that's where my family is from, like near there. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm like super bored and lonely and I was taking classes online and I hated it. And so I was like, I need something fun to do that I like to do. And I love like creating um, and being creative in that way. And so I sort of like, I think I like vlogged my birthday or something. And then that sort of like spiraled into like, <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to do this YouTube thing. And then like, at first there was like no niche. Like, I don't know what I was supposed to just random stuff. Like my birthday, my cousin's birthday, my dad's surprise party. Like it was just random stuff on the channel. And then um, I went to Pittsburgh and there, there was like this, uh, I want to say like this this like aura about social media and being a psychologist they're like don't be on social media lock down all your stuff and so then i didn't i wasn't really doing much youtube there either i think i was doing like food hauls or something like stuff that didn't really matter so then when i moved to st louis i was like no like i think it's important to do like youtube about psychology there was like no one really doing like academic influencing when I started, when I was like, okay, I'm just gonna try this. Like, I'm gonna be like, what's in my bag? Or like stuff that people were doing for undergrad and just like apply it to grad school. Um, yeah. 
And so then I was like, well, there's all this stuff that I know that I didn't know before. And I'm sure other people don't know. And so I was like, well, there's no use of like me dying with this knowledge. I might as well share it. And that's really important to me. And so I was just like, okay, so whatever I learned, I'm going to put on this channel. And yeah, so that's sort of like where we've been. Uh, I had to like take a break from the channel for a little bit just with transitioning to internship. But I plan on like making, well, I've made a couple of videos about like applying to internship, how to like apply. Um, and then I am going to like talk about applying the postdoc. And then I don't know. I don't know what will happen with the channel after that. I want to continue doing like science communication stuff, like about articles or like cool research yeah. stuff that I think is interesting. Um, but yeah, there's just like lots to do on the channel and just not as much time to do it, I feel like um but yeah i think that's where we're going like maybe some more like science communication -y stuff oh my gosh no that is so cool like i said i mean i feel like you are one of the the innovators of just like that social media influence of mm -hmm. clinical psychology because i think it really is important because you know for so many people especially like even as i was in high school or even in college like Clinical psychology was just not one of the things that was talked about a lot, either from faculty or professors or from other people. And it was really for, hard for me to find information about it. And I feel like the virtual space, you can have sort of a virtual coach or a virtual mentor to actually kind of help you through that process. And I love social media for that. I mean, obviously there's so many cons of social media, but that huge pro, it really is being able to help people kind of realize what they want to do and to be able to see themselves doing that in the future. And so that's yeah. why, yeah, I love your channel for that. Oh, so. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that that was one of the things that was really hard for me. Like I knew like one clinical psychologist, but at the time I didn't know she was a clinical psychologist. She was like my professor at Hampton. Um, and so like when I was asking people about like, okay, I don't want to do like social psychology. Like I really want to do this clinical psychology thing. Like no one really had any answers for me. And so like, it took like me leaving Hampton and like going to Pittsburgh, they have like this bridge program to like bridge people into PhD programs and me being like, hey, I don't know how to do this. Like I need help. Do you know anybody? Can you connect me to people? And so I think, you know, there's just like not enough knowledge. And like, I even now I still feel like there's stuff I don't know about clinical psychology that I'm like finding out. I'm like, oh man, I should have known that. <laughs> but yeah, I think, yeah, I feel like there's almost like people are like afraid to tell like what clinical psychology is. Like we're very important. And maybe like, maybe there's like stigma around like being like psychologists and supposed to be like blank slates and we're not supposed to tell people how to get into the field or whatever or like gatekeeping maybe. Um, but yeah, I just feel like that was like so unfair. And I was like, how are all these people getting into these programs and I can't figure it out. <laughs> I think that's such a, a valuable point that you bring up because I think that, I don't know with psychology that for me, I think, you know, it's one thing to be in the mental health professional as a, as a minority, right? And mm -hmm. to even have that kind of mental health stigma in certain communities and stuff like that and kind of breaking through from that and being, uh, being able to represent who you are, uh, especially for others who may have not seen themselves in that space initially, I think is really, really, really key. And so I'm hopeful of, of where the profession goes. I think. I'd have to double check, but I think 4% of clinical psychologists are like African-American. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's one of those things of like, well, how do we get the word out there? How do we approach other maybe high school students or college students who yeah. may not, may not even be on their radar, but how do we, how do we promote it in a way that people can see how they might also want to help their community as well and breaking yeah. that stigma. So. For sure. I wish like, I wish like high school Tanisha, would have like had the opportunity to like just know that there's so many other things in psychology besides like being a marriage and family therapist or just being a therapist in general. So yeah, I wish that. Uh, yeah, and so I've been doing a little bit of that, like talking back with my high school professor or my high school teacher. Like I've talked to students in his class about psychology and I'm like, this class changed my life. Like it can change <laughs> your life too. Come to psychology, it'll be great. <laughs> 
That's so cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I guess one last、um, thing that I want to also talk about is so you talked a little bit about your, your graduate、um, career with your first and your second year.、Um, you're in your internship now. What about the dissertation process? I know I've gotten questions about students asking me about the dissertation process and what that's like、uh, for clinical psychology students. Now that you're in your internship, how has that process been for you as you're either starting on your dissertation or finishing up your dissertation? How,、yeah. how has that process been like for you? Yeah, so for my program, you have to propose before you apply. And so、um, my proposal has been done for a minute. I had lots of hiccups with、uh, data collection, but that's not anyone's fault. It's the internet, I suppose.、Um, so I guess the process has been. Pretty, I think something that I didn't realize about clinical psychology that's different from other fields is that you're still doing your dissertation while you're still doing clinical work, while you're still potentially in classes. And so, considering that, like, you're still balancing all the stuff you had before now, plus your dissertation, I think I underestimated how much time all that takes.、Um, and so, yeah, so I'm in. The stage now. I finished data collection, I think, in May.、Um, yeah, probably like May, June. And then I've been working on getting the data analyzed and clean. I had like like 600 bots in my data, like from Twitter. Like it just,、wow. yeah, it was actually crazy. But I, then I was like begging on Twitter. I was like, please, somebody take my survey. And then so I got a lot of people to take it then. And so、uh, now I'm just like cleaning and writing. Um, doing like data analysis. And then I still have to,、um, I think, rework my literature review a little bit better so that I can account for like all the data changes we had to do. But yeah, it's going. It's just like time consuming, I suppose. <laughs> and, and what is your topic? Oh, yeah. So I'm looking at、um, social economic status in African Americans、um, and basically like how being higher SES changes. Your experiences with discrimination and dis- experiences with like mental health outcomes, so like psychological well being, but also like distress, anxiety, depression,、um, and seeing how like people who are of more affluence navigate that relationship basically. That's fascinating. I, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure the literature is really interesting on that because I do think that obviously you have so many different dynamics when it comes to racism or discrimination. And how economics can impact that. But that's really interesting too, how it could also, based on your, your social economic status, how the perception of that can, can change based on you know, where you are in your career or how much money you have. Right,、so. exactly. Yeah, that's sort of what I found in my thesis. There w a s like not as many affluent people in there, but there w a s like a couple of results where like, People who were more affluent and had more experiences of discrimination had like higher purpose in life. And I'm like, what? Like, how does that make sense? And so I wanted my dissertation to sort of be an extension of that idea of like, okay, why did we find that result?、Um, and why, like, what does it mean to be like affluent and black and experiencing discrimination? Oh my so, yeah. gosh. <laughs> That's exciting stuff. I'm sure it's going to、yeah, be, I'm sure it's going to be really, really good. I'm working on my dissertation right now, and it is a marathon. Is, there's、oh, so、sure. much to do, so much to think about. So, very,、yeah. very cool. Well, Tanisha, thank you so much for kind of taking us through a little bit of your graduate program. I am、uh, super just thankful that you were able to give us the time today to be able to kind of talk through about that.、Sure. And I'm sure my audience also very much appreciates it as well. So, Thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me so much.